Um, we have here Danielle Bays, a uh, senior analyst for in uh, cat protection and policy with the Humane Society of the United States. And she's going to do Cat Pretty, a game of current affairs. The community cats, this community cats takes on the Jeopardy game show and we'll get you up to speed on hot topics uh, for politics, era files, and the latest muse from the world of cats. So this is going to be fun. I can't wait to see this. Uh, Danielle Bays is a frequent speaker. She is a friend of the Community Cats podcast, and I love her advice and her resources. She has been great award-winning author and a whiz at Cat Trivia. As the senior analyst for the Cat, Cat Protection and Policy at the Humane Society of the United States, Danielle works with animal shelters, cat advocates, policymakers, and other stakeholders to broaden support for community cats nationwide. Uh, so I'm going to hand things over to Danielle. I can't wait to see this. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining uh, Cat Pretty as a game of current affairs. It is better than Wordle. That's all I'm going to say today. So welcome. And I am going to invite you to get ready here and to put your thinking cat on. Um, we're going to play a game of Cat Pretty. Um, it's going to be a little bit different because uh, we don't actually have contestants and, um, and buzzers. So you are going to be in charge of keeping track of your own scores and determining if you win or not. And it's also going to be a little different because I'm going to talk a lot more than Alex Trebek used to talk. Um, so hopefully this will work and you will all be entertained by our game. Okay, so here are our categories today in Cat for D. We have politics, new research, bad caddish, state house scuttlebutt, historical events, and tabby tech. Each of these categories will have a clue and then we'll have more information and answer. Um, so we're going to start off our category here with politics for $200. Here's our clue. Veterinary clinic certified fear-free or accredited by the American Association of Feline Practitioners as cat-friendly practice no longer perform this procedure, widely considered inhumane. That's right, folks. The answer is elective declawing surgeries. The American Association of Feline Practitioners uh, announced last January in 2001 that it would no longer accredit veterinary clinics that declaw cats under its cat-friendly practice program. The thousand plus practices already enrolled were given six months to discontinue declawing in order to stay cat-friendly. And then in June, Fear Free announced that as of December 31st of this past year, practices bearing their certification aimed at improving the emotional experiences of cats during vet visits would no longer offer elective declawing. I hope all of you got that right. Okay, we're gonna go back to the board here and keep, let's work, keep going on that category. Politics for 400. Austin, Texas, St. Louis County, Missouri, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Madison, Wisconsin. What do all these places have in common? Yes, they are places that passed declaw bans in 2021. So they joined New York State, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and about six other California cities, and Denver, uh, Colorado, the city and the county, city of St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, and hopefully there will be uh, more names that we can add to that list the next time we come back and play Cat Purdy. Okay, that's a pretty good, pretty good category. Let's try that for 600. So a review of six years of data from shelters across British Columbia busted this common myth about declaw bans. And I have down here at the bottom of the slide, the reference to the paper that I'm talking about here. But what they found is that Declaw bans, uh, the myth is that declaw bans would lead to an increase in cat surrender to shelters. And they found that not to be true. It's an 
often argument that we hear against banning declawing is that if people can't declaw their cat, they're going to surrender that cat to the shelter, and then that cat is going to be put in danger of euthanasia. Um, the researchers here looked at intake, euthanasias, length of stay from shelters across British Columbia for three years prior to the province-wide ban, and then three years after the ban. And they found this just not to be true. There was no increase in the number of cats. Um, it was pretty much the same, the length of stay, the amount of time that the cat stayed in the shelters during that, that period. Um, it was pretty much the same. Um, and euthanasias did not increase. In fact, they, they declined a little bit. Uh, may have been due to other factors, but the, the point is here that when you enact a ban against declawing, it's not going to mean a whole bunch of cats are going to be um, at risk of being euthanized because of that. Um, you know, the study also found that destructive behavior really wasn't a common reason for surrender um, to cats at, at the shelter at all. There were a lot of other um, other issues that were a little bit more um, higher ranked. That is a really good uh, study if you're dealing with um, folks in your community about um, posing a declaw ban um, and they're concerned about um, cat welfare, that that might be a concern. This is a good study to, to point them to. Okay, let's continue on. We're gonna do politics for 800. So the city of Los Angeles this past year honored these two organizations for their efforts to end decline. And I might have given away the answer there once with the little uh, link at the bottom to the PAW Project. And that is one of the organizations, the PAW Project, um, which has been at the forefront of efforts to ban declawing across the US, um, as well as um, they honored the VCA Banfield Mars Veterinary Health Clinics. Um, these, the, the Banfield, VCA, and Blue Pearl um, Hospital chains across the country all, are all owned by Mars Veterinary Health, and they are all opposed to decline. So none of those veterinary hospitals allow decline at any of their um, like 2,000 hospitals across the country. Um, they they employ something like you know 10,000 vets across the country, and and none of those um, practices are doing elective decline. Um, Los Angeles banned decline uh, in 2009. It was one of the the first communities to do so, and a lot of that was um, due to the efforts of the Paw Project. So they are an excellent resource for any information about declawing um, and declawing legislation. Okay, let me get back to our our panel here. But let's finish out that category, politics for 1,000. Legislation to prohibit decline is currently pending in these states. This changes almost every day. Right now we have bills pending in Massachusetts, Maryland, New Hampshire, Arizona, New Jersey, and then in the District of Columbia, the future 51st state. Um, we anticipate bills in other states, like Pennsylvania and others uh, being introduced uh, at some point this year as legislative sessions uh, in the various states get underway. Um, we anticipate Minnesota to introduce a bill that would prohibit landlords from requiring cats to be declawed um, as a condition of people being able to rent their properties there. Uh, California and Rhode Island currently have uh, laws like that. Um, and there are, you know, there's there's really been a huge increase in this kind of declaw legislation since New York passed a ban a few years ago, and more and more communities are putting this forth. So I am not surprised to see bills come up in, in communities or states that had not been anticipated because there is such a wave of support for this kind of work. Well, that, that ends that category, but I'm sure you like all this kind of politics. We're gonna move over to state house scuttlebutt. In this category, we're gonna talk about legislation from last year um, and what happened to it. What's the scuttlebutt? 
Let's start with 200. So Connecticut, there was an act concerning animal welfare. And I love bills that have titles like this, an act concerning animal welfare. Um, you're not really sure what that means. Um, those kind of general animal welfare bills, they cover a lot of ground. They make changes to various parts of existing animal law. Um, and just like this one, they do, they do a lot of stuff. Um, this one passed. And the key takeaways here for cats, um, and my favorite part really, is that it increased funding for the animal population control programs, feral cat grant program. Um, and it increased reimbursement to veterinarians participating in the program. And uh, um, so that will enable a greater number of, of cats um, to get spayed and neutered through those programs. Um, it also did some, some nice updates like decreasing rabies quarantine from six months to four months for a certain situation. So um, that is helping keep our laws up to date with uh, the latest science and recommendation on those things. So should be some good stuff for cats there in Connecticut. Okay, let's do state house scuttlebutt for 400. Oh, this is New Jersey's Compassion for Community Cats Act. Um, so this bill passed one committee in the last legislative session in New Jersey, but didn't make it farther than that. Um, it is a bill that has been introduced in the past and it is has been introduced again for this year, the session 2022. Uh, under the name House Bill 179. So what this does is it creates um, the Community Cats Fund to support municipal TNR programs. It expands the use of the New Jersey Animal Population Control Fund to qualified pets and to community cats. It reduces stray holds for cats provided that there's a pathway to a live outcome. Um, and it removes the mandate that the animal control officers impound healthy stray cats. Um, so this would be a real boon for our community cat programs and shelters participating in these uh, programs. They won't have to hold cats longer than they need to to just get them sterilized and back out in the community. And as well, the animal control officers won't have to be impounding cats that don't need to be impounded. So again, that is uh, has been reintroduced um, just this month. Um, it is now called S179, and hopefully it'll get some more traction and we'll be able to come back and tell you more about that in our next game of Cat Party. How are y'all doing? You, you all getting 100%? You're all like uh, gonna be the, the Tim Jennings of the, of the, the Cat Party world? And get yeah, all no, these. I just, I just have to share with you. Everybody out here is enjoying this thoroughly, and they're answering <laughs> in the questions box because I know you can't see it. So everybody is really enjoying this. So you might feel like you're talking to the computer, but you're really not. You do have a huge audience out there. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Stacy. And I am confident that you and I will be able to figure out how to do this with contestants at some point in the future. Um. Cool. Okay. Well, I'm going to continue on with this state house scuttlebutt. Okay. So Illinois had this bill, Animal Control Act and Feral Cat Population. Um, so this this was an interesting bill. I, I guess it it did pass, um, but there's a qualifier that the content was completely changed. Um, and I think this is a good lesson. In, in law making, um, that it is a process. And just because um, a bill starts out saying one thing, when it comes out the other side, it may so say something completely different. Um, so the initial gist of this bill um, was to help humanely reduce feral cat population in the state. Um, the Department of Agriculture of the state may provide guidance for operation of programs for trapping, neutering or spaying, vaccination, and return or release of feral cats, provided that no other state agency has any jurisdiction over feral cats. So essentially what it was trying to do was to tell the wildlife agencies that they did not have jurisdictions over cats that were free roaming outdoors, um, and that the Department of Agriculture, which oversees other programs for um, companion animals, would be the lead agency. 
Well, that didn't fly. And all of that was stricken from the law. Um, but there had been another friendly amendment added to it that was uh, retained. And what that did was simply update some of the language in existing law that talked about surgical sterilization to make it not refer to surgical sterilization. Um, the idea is that if we uh, are not limiting our thoughts of spaying and neutering being a surgical process, um, we have the opportunity, once it's available, to utilize um, non-surgical methods like injectable, um, like a one-shot one spay shot which we anticipate will actually be available um, in the next five to seven years. So it did something good and useful in the end, but the law that passed had nothing to do with what the original content was. So um, I guess that may be a, a, a pass fail for that piece of legislation. Okay, let's move on to 800. Make this a little harder. Rhode Island. Last year had the bill number HB 5462, unowned, feral, or free roaming cat spay and neuter. Um, this bill provides that the trapping and subsequent release of any unowned, feral, or free roaming cat for the purpose of spaying and neutering of the cat shall not be considered abandonment. Um, and that was the original intent of this, this legislation when it was introduced several years ago. Um, however, like the bill in Illinois, it was changed over the course of time, um, and it has additional requirements for trap neuter return programs, including one that requires written permission for property owners. So if you're conducting TNR, you need to have written permission from the property owner before going on their property in order to do any kind of um, TNR work. Um, this it was added by the Rhode Island State Veterinarian who's not in support of TNR programs and decided that even though there are trespassing laws in the state, um, us folks out there doing TNR needed to meet a higher bar. Um, so this bill did not pass last year. Um, it's a bill that could do some good things, but having this, this extra standard of written permission, um, I think goes a little too far and it is not a provision I know most people would like to see. I, I think about when you're out there in the field and you're doing TNR and you, you, know, you can't just get oral permission, verbal permission from someone, you would need written permission and that could really um, make things a lot more difficult um, and harder to get the number of cats spayed and neutered. So, um, it's again a, a lesson of when you try to do one thing at a legislative level, um, you're not the only one who is, has input on what those bills say, and other people, uh, especially people in uh, official positions like a state veterinarian, um, can intervene and make the bill that you liked at the beginning something that is not necessarily something you want to see pass. So. Um, it can make it can make it difficult in something like this that sounds good uh, when you're talking about um, promoting TNR programs and the TNR is not abandonment. That sounds good, but when you get into the nitty gritty, sometimes um, what do, what do they say? Like you, making laws, it's like making sausage, something that you don't want to see. So, okay, we got one more in that category. Let's finish that out. State House scuttlebutt for a thousand. Ah, Virginia. Virginia last year had this bill, SB 1390, trap, neuter, and return programs for cats. So this bill would have authorized any public or private animal shelter, releasing agency, or hospital or clinic that has operated under the immediate supervision of a duly licensed veterinarian to operate a trap, neuter, and return program is defined in the bill. It exempts volunteers of such programs from provisions related to abandonment and licensing of animals and exempts the operator from general requirements of shelters um, related to this. Um, now, this is a bill that did not pass as well. Um, and what happened is that the, the Senate committee decided that all of the stakeholders would get together and have a task force um, after the session was over and, and 
um, leading up into the beginning of the legislative session this year, and we're going to work out the details. Um, so this was all the, the animal shelters, uh, or representatives for animal shelters, TNR folks, um, the wildlife folks, um, and other constituencies in the state that had different opinions on this. Um, and it is not surprising that after meeting four times, they did not come to any kind of agreement. Um, you know, these issues are long standing and not easily resolved. Uh, but <clears throat> the group is continuing to try to come to some sort of um, agreement on some things for cats. Um, but one of the things that I think is really important here is that when we're at this this state level um, that you know the the folks on the the anti tnr wildlife side of things are are really strong stakeholders in the issue um, and they have um, very strong beliefs about what happens um, but even though they may not fully understand how community cat programs work and what's going on and and how efforts are aimed at um, really helping all the animals. Um, but it's also important to recognize that what we do on the ground level, the kind of TNR work um, and the caretaking practices and how they impact our local wildlife, even just like individual things we do, can reverberate into that larger issue and have um, consequences um, for policy at a larger level. So it's really important that we are, um, we're really thinking about that and how what we might do or don't do um, or how we may say things or come across um, can really impact our ability to have um, laws that en enable us to do these kind of things. So for me, that's the big takeaway for this. I am hopeful that um, Virginia will um, move forward and be able to um, craft some laws that expand um, what I think of as our, our toolkit to be able to do more TNR um, at the shelter level um, <clears throat> and help cats and the wildlife out there at the same time. Okay, let's see what category is next. I think we should go to Mew Research for 200. Okay, and this one I am gonna tell you the title of a research article, something that was published in the past year. <clears throat> and then we're gonna talk about what it says. Um, so this one, introducing a controlled outdoor environment impacts positively in cat welfare and owner concerns, the use of a new feline welfare assessment tool. Sometimes they make these titles a little bit more complicated than what they are. Essentially what this is about is the benefits of catios or other kinds of containment systems like cat fencing <clears throat> that allows cats to have um, protected access out, outdoors. So this was a study in the UK of cat welfare. That's they use this kind of welfare assessment tool that was developed um, to determine um, the welfare of the cats before and after having access to a catio or a, 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 a fenced, like a containment system, which would be like cat fencing. Um, the cats in the study may have been indoor cats only before. They may have been cats that had already had outdoor access. Um, it was a mix of that. But overall, they found positive results. Um, you know, we know there are dangers to living outdoors, such as, you know, cars, predators, and other cats that might get in a fight with. <clears throat> and then indoor lifestyle also has some of its own challenges where cats can, you know, tend to get a little bit chonkier, they get bored, they might be stressed. Um, uh, you know, they may enjoy the, the benefits of enrichment of a little bit of outdoor time. But there's not a lot of research so far on the benefits of catio. So this, uh, the study really uh, is is moving into new new territory here, um, and it was limited in scope. But you know the surveys were given to people who had recently purchased 
um, a system, a, a CADIO system. Um, I think it was a particular uh, brand that they used to be able to get um, participants in that. But it really starts thinking about the benefits of um, our indoor cats of getting time outdoors um, and the benefits it has to the, the cat guardians of how they feel that their cats are benefiting and um, feeling more um, confident that their cats are in a safe environment. So looking forward to seeing more research in the future on patios. Okay, I'm going to keep going on this Mew research. State of the Munion. You know, I love a good cat pun. This is State of the Munion, Practices of Feral Cat Care and Advocacy Organizations in the United States. So this is the results of a survey of us cat people from back in 2018. It was published last year. Um, and I, it's an open source article. So if you put all this uh, in your, put the title in your uh, Google search, it'll come up and you could read the whole paper. And I would encourage you to do that uh, and see how what you're doing compares to what the survey found to be standard practices. It also highlighted some areas where we as a field have an opportunity to improve and find innovative solutions to some common challenges. So um, it was looking at everything from TNR practices to uh, caretaking to some of the veterinary standards, uh, data collection, um, and a whole host of things. So um, it's really um, one of the, the first kind of inventories of the you know in the field um, community cat work um, and it's it's um, very accessible and reading it's not one of those um, journal articles that half of it is talking about how they do their statistics and things that unless you're a statistician doesn't mean it a lot to you but um, i think it, it would be a really uh, great read for any folks who are out there doing kind of anyone who's here spending the weekend with us this is a this is a paper for you to read. Excellent. Okay, let's go to 600. Oh, this is a good one. Reduction of free roaming cat population requires high intensity neutering and spatial contiguity to mitigate compensatory effects. <clears throat> so, this is really a paper that shows how feasible TNR is. Um, again, I love these titles, who comes up with the complexity of them. So this was a 12-year study of TNR in Israel, and it really showed the feasibility of an effective citywide TNR effort that led to a decrease in cat populations. <clears throat> what they found is that, you know, TNR should be done at a high intensity um, and ongoing. Um, they, interestingly, they found that they had an increase in the cat population citywide when there wasn't TNR and when TNR was performed just in the target areas and not in the other areas. But when they did the, the sustained high intensity TNR across the city um, and their, their target was greater than 70% TNR for the cats um, in the city. Um, and when they got that, they had citywide reduction in cat populations. Um, they also found that this should be no surprise to any any of us um, that to boost the effort, having complementary programs, um, these are the the mitigating the compensatory effects. We're um, adding things like adoption programs, anti-abandonment efforts, um, and things like that for a more integrated cap program. Um, you know, we often find that, um, you know, how how can we show that what we're doing in TNR is, is working. Do we have a lot of uh, literature that we can point to that has data um, that shows that we can do this, that in a city situation, we can across the board reduce that cat population. And this is one of, um, I think one of the first studies that really looks at this um, from the time that it was all going on, rather than a lot of our studies where we're looking retroactively back at data um, from the past. Um, so this is 12 years long, which is a pretty significant period of time in TNR. And I think this is gonna be really useful 
for us moving forward. And hopefully we'll see more studies like this to help um, bolster our efforts to get more acceptance for TNR programs. Okay, 800. Guidance for management of free roaming community cats, a bioeconomic analysis. I don't think I've ever used the term bioeconomic before, um, but um, <laughs> basically what this does is talks about how much does TNR and other cat population strategies cost to conduct. Um, this is a third of a kind of a population modeling study from the Alliance for Contraception in Cats and Dogs. Um, they used computer simulation to compare different levels of TNR and various cat removal scenarios um, and the impact that those would have on a long-term population of cats as well as so it was kind of like the first study. The second one looked at um, the numbers of cats who would die, kind of the unintended deaths of those cats, particularly kittens uh, with those different scenarios. Um, and then this one is looking at what, what are the costs of each of those strategies? So what is the cost of doing um, high intensity TNR? What is the cost of say, you know, like your typical um, traditional animal control um, trap and remove program? Like what are the different costs of those, not just um, in your initial for those that cat in particular, but when you look at that across the, a 10 year period, and how many cats are, you know, the population of cats that is going to change over time. Um, and what is the cost for that long-term program? And then what is the cost like for each, um, to reach a goal, what would that be? So it's really, um, I think really helpful in giving that kind of information to, um, you know, like our, your local governments who that may be like they, they want the cat population reduced or managed or dealt with in some way, but they really just want to know what it's going to cost. Um, so the key findings in this were that the high intensity removal is effective at decreasing the cat population, but it's really only cost efficient with lethal approaches, um, which are then not popular for other reasons, like because we don't really want to euthanize the cats. Um, they found that the high intensity TNR is significantly more effective at decreasing the population, preventing kitten deaths, and controlling the cost than lower intensity TNR. They also found that removal for adoption is a humane alternative, but it costs more. Um, and that would make sense because we're taking those cats and putting them in an adoption program, caring for them over a period of time. Um, and that's, there's costs associated with that. Um, immigration and abandonment of cats can sabotage success. Again, it's not a surprise for, for many of us who you've TNR'd a whole group of cats um, and then a new cats move in and they start uh, repopulating that area. So um, this again is showing on a scientific way, those things that many of us um, kind of have knowledge of. Um, they also found that the management approach and intensity, so whether it was like a high intensity TNR or low intensity TNR, um, they really dramatically affected the number of preventable deaths over time. So Alliance for Contraception in Cats and Dogs has a whole bunch of new support materials around this. Um, they have posted them since I made these slides, so I don't have a direct link to them. But if you go to their website, which is acc-d, Dot .org um, and look for their population modeling information. Um, I think there might be a link on the homepage now for this too. Um, they have a couple new um, updated documents and probably will have some more things coming out about this in um, the coming month because I know they're super excited about having this, this information. Whew. Okay, let's Let's finish out this category, new research for a thousand. Oh, this is a fun one. A domestic cat model of, tri I can't even say half these words, triarctic psychopathy factors, development and initial validation of the cat tribe plus questionnaire. Yeah, 
So this study got a lot of press with headlines like, is your cat a psychopath? Probably, says researchers. Um, and think of it as like catnip clickbait and, and many readers can't you know, resist clicking through to these kind of things. The media loves that kind of stuff. But the science isn't really good. Um, you know, it examines cats as if they were humans, um, not as like they were cats, which they are. Um, so like what is normal behavior in a cat is not normal behavior in a human. And so using a human scale of being a psychopath and applying that to a cat just really doesn't make sense. Um, uh, the two links I added to the slide at the bottom are actually articles that um, are from cat behavior folks and veterinarians that talk about the problems with that study um, and how it is not really um, it's not really good science. Um, and I just put this in here as really as a reminder that just because something is published in a, as a scientific paper doesn't mean um, it's good science. Um, it we have to use our critical thinking, um, recognize you know some things are done well, um, some things may be, may be faulty, there may be problems with the methodology or just the, the basic premise like in this. Um, so just a thought that just because um, you read something, especially um, in, the, in the mass media that says your cat is a psychopath, you know, your cat probably is not a psychopath. <sighs> okay, I'll take a breath here. Okay, I'm gonna go to bad caddish. You're probably wondering what is bad caddish. Um, that's the word I made up for this this game, bad caddish. So in this, we're gonna talk about some words and terminology that might not be the best terms, and we might want to think about. The first one. Oh, this is my favorite. Oh, probably not my favorite. I probably have a favorite coming up. Trap neuter release. Trap, neuter, return. We should all be saying trap, neuter, return um, and be really careful about using the term release. Um, I find there are a lot of organizations that don't really support trap, neuter, return. will say they support trap, neuter, release because they're defining the release as removing from the environment and releasing into a shelter, releasing into a sanctuary, releasing into a home, not releasing back to where that cat came from. Um, and it's... I think it's uh, it's disingenuous of them to do that, but um, you know this tends to be uh, populated by a lot of um, more anti-cat conservationists who um, are happy to, with the trap and the neuter part, um, but it's that return that they can't get in, they can't buy into, um, so they'll use the term release and they mean something else. So um, just be very cognizant of using the term release instead of return. <sighs> Caddish for 400. Crazy cat lady. Do I really need to say anything about that? My neighbors probably all think I'm crazy too, but you know, the, uh, this crazy cat lady is really like started out as a, like a historical trope of anti uh, feminists, anti-voting rights, and all sorts of um, things that really had nothing to do with cats, but but using this visual of of people, ladies with cats, and that was, um, you know, just because we associate with cats is a negative. So, you know, this is something that we try to own, we try to embrace in the sense that we're going to retake this language, um, and it, it can be fun, but um, we also just want to be really aware of um, how it's been used in the past in a very harmful way. Okay, I'm going to move on to 600, tame. So this is one that I've, I've, I'm learning from my cat behavior expert friends um, that when you're talking about like taming a kitten, a little kissy pop kitten, um, that taming can be thought of as more like tolerance as opposed to really socialization, um, that the kitten is just um, um, 
tolerating being petted. Um, and it's important to think about, like, you know, in order for that, that kitten to live a successful life and not grow up to be the cat that hides under the bed, they need to do more than just tolerate people. So I have become much more cognizant of how I use the word tame um, and also thinking about it in the context as an opposite of wild and what I might, when I might not want to be portraying a cat as uh, as wild um, is also kind of a negative connotation. Oh, let's do bad caddish for 800. Colony. I was going to talk about this, but um, I'm going to just instead direct you to the the blog that I wrote for the Community Cats podcast. Thank you, Stacy, for giving me that opportunity um, to talk about um, the word colony and what it might mean and why we might want to rethink that. So that is going to be your homework for next week or tonight, or in case you've already read it. Thank you so much. And bad caddish for a thousand. Feral, Ugh, this is probably my favorite one. Um, you know, I, I looked up feral on vocabulary.com and it says feral is often used to describe a wild untamed animal, like the feral cat with its claws and sharp teeth, menacingly bared, ready to strike. Ooh. I'm thinking, which one of my neighbors wants that cat in her community? Um, you know, we, this is a, it's such a hard one because it is, is such part of our community. And we tend to use the term really as kind of a badge of honor. I think, you know, it's like ear tips are hip, feral cats are cool. Um, but what do other people think when we use that term? Um, you know, when we talk about a feral cat, even if it's a, a feral, a friendly feral, which is just an oxymoron. Like what is the message that we're sending them that we have these wild cats that might attack them in their neighborhood? Um, so I just wanna challenge everyone to think about this. I know it is really hard um, in just kind of thinking about more precisely about the language we use. Um, this is all part of an ongoing conversation. I'm gonna be hosting a panel conversation at, on this at Animal Care Expo and I expect we'll continue to have conversations like this. Um, over the course of the, the rest of the year and the future, just to, to kind of think about how we're using these terms and, and what they might mean and how we might want to say things better. We don't have answers. I can't say don't use feral, use this term. Um, I mean, I just maybe just say cat. Leave you with that. Okay, how are we on time here? Let's, we're gonna jump over to Tabby Tech for 200. This is an easy one here. I'm going to give a shout out for some of our people here. Develop with the help of some Community Cat Podcast frequent flyers. This app aims to help cat people find the perfect match. I feel like I'm giving this away here too in the title. Yeah, this is the Tabby Dates app, and you can get more information about this from Community Cat Podcast episode 388. Or maybe if uh, if Sterling's back on and one of our future uh, panels later, you can ask him about that. Okay, what's in some more Tabby Tech 400? Launched this last year, the Tab Lee app uses artificial intelligence, a photo of your cat and the feline grimace scale to determine this. Again, this is on episode 418 of the Community Cat Podcast. The answer is pain. So the, the feline grimace scale was a tool developed by the University of Montreal. Um, and so this app uses that. It's kind of looking at um, changes in your cat's face, the position of the whiskers, the muzzle, their eyes, their ears, their head, um, subtle changes of kind of indicating um, level of pain. So this app uses um, artificial intelligence and that scale put together um, that you could, you know, take a photo of your cat and it will analyze it and it can help you determine, you know, if you need to go see a veterinarian or if you've seen the veterinarian and maybe the vet's given your cat pain medication, you know, how well is it working? And then you can give feedback to your veterinarian for that. Not, not a, a substitute for a veterinarian, but just another tool we can use. And also it's just pretty cool because 
um, you know, there's so much of this kind of um, tech and science and stuff that's always focused on dogs. So I'm always excited when there is something that focuses on cats. Let's do Tabby Tech for 600. Woohoo! Another one of my favorites. The DC Cat Count Project published this guide to help your, you monitor cat populations in your own community. This is a pretty simple one. It is a cat counting toolkit. You can find it at that link at the bottom. And I know we're going to hear more about cat counting in the next hour. So I won't, uh, I won't delve too deep into that. Um, but that's a really um, handy toolkit to learn more. And I anticipate you'll be hearing a lot more about cat counting and, and data collection and monitoring um, in the year to come. Ooh. Okay, I'm going to go to uh, Tabby Tech for 800 here. Cat trappers were buzzing about this remote trapping device designed by Deb Skilton Webster, known in TNR circles as the closer. This, this is something I'm excited about and I haven't tried myself, but it is what she calls a robo trap. Combines a portable hotspot, motion sensitive live streaming camera, and a trap outfitted with a Wi Fi enabled switch wired to a car door um, actuator, um, kind of the opener and closer connected to the trap's lever. So she can sit at home, watch the cat go in the trap, and then trigger it just on her phone. It's pretty cool. There's an article here, linked to the bottom, to talk about this. Um, I know on uh, the uh, Community Cat United. Uh, Facebook group, there is a whole thread that talks about this and a lot of information there. Um, but it's really looking at how we can utilize um, different skill sets that people have, different backgrounds and di different information we have um, to kind of make trapping um, more savvy, more successful. You know, those cats that aren't going to come anywhere near your trap when there's a person anywhere nearby. Uh, but you still want to keep a look at it. You want to watch, you want to maybe be able to have a remote closure device, you know, things that, that may help catch that last cat. These are those things. So I'm um, always thinking about new ways to do things and excited to see all the innovation and creative thinking out there. Okay, let's get it to go to Tabby. Oh, no, you know what? I'm going to, yeah, well, let's just close this out. Tabby Tech for a thousand. Biotech startup because animals joined the cultured meat craze announcing the development of this product. Folks heard about this? Yeah, it's a cat food derived from lab ground mouse meat. Yeah, I think this is fascinating. So there's all this, you know, lab grown meat, cultured meat where you can, um, you know, just take one animal cell and create a whole bunch of, of product. Well, this company decided to focus on cat food um, and using all of the science that was out there already um, with, with mice, because mice have been used, um, you know, very broadly um, in, in science. Um, so this was a way like to look at a more, I guess, sustainable, more natural kind of diet for cats. Um, and they have created this um, this cultured mouse food, um, and um, are supposed to be launching. Uh, I guess this year is a cat a mouse meat cat cookie um, is the start. It's a kind of a treat before the full cat food product comes out. Um, and the first cat in history to eat the cultured mouse was Frankie. It was a rescue kitty that cohabitates with the company's co-founder. So um, I am very interested in this and, and wondering if my cats would um, would like to eat some, some cultured mouse meat or not. Okay. Woohoo. You're all probably wondering this. I was going to ask you, like, what's the name of the first cat of the United States? I think everyone's seen the news that the Bidens have Willow have moved into the White House this past week. But instead, I'm going to, Final Caprity is your predictions for the top news 
of 2022. So I just would like to take this time to open it up to hear your thoughts and questions. All right, all right. Well, uh, one question that I saw out here for you, Danielle, this was awesome. Everybody loved it, so that I'll share that. But um, if folks are interested in getting legislation proposed in their state, what should they do? They can reach out to me if they'd like, and I can help them, direct them to the key people. Is that for anything, for decline, for community cats? Um, I guess I would just probably answer that the same. Reach out to me. You can um, reach me. Uh, my email address is D as in Danielle, B as in Bays, B-A-Y-S at humanesociety.org. And I can connect you with either help or connect you with um, some other folks to to do that. Super. Or let me know if there's already a already something going on in your state. Connect people. Yeah, and I did mention what was it? it did do you still can you still put in like Massachusetts at humanesociety.org and you'll go somewhere that way too? Yes, you will be connected to the your state director uh, for that state. Um, I know we have some states that don't have state directors, so I think that might, if you those states, that email might go to someone else. But gotcha, excellent. We okay. try to make it easy for y'all. So good. Um, I think that I'm not seeing any other questions from anybody. Everything was everything was pretty straightforward, and we added. Uh, some of the details from the slides out into the chat. So everybody's busy with their homework right now. And um, and so either that or they're all on the dating app putting their profiles in. <laughs> I will say in the historical events, um, there are links there for more information on all of those. It's just honestly, that whole chart of the Jeopardy game board, there was a lot of squares to fill in there. So. Um, I wanted to put some good content in there that I didn't necessarily need to to chat with you about because I know I can get chatty. So, but I would love to hear if people you know want to post maybe in the the Facebook group of like what your predictions are for what's going to be the hot topic or what is the hot topic or the new technology or what are your what are your predictions? I got to figure out a good cat pun for this. Paul, I predict. Mine, mine's all around, you know, the veterinary sh shortage. I mean, I, I'm, I'm tired of the conversation, but I also feel like there's so much work to be done with for not, and I, I don't like calling it veterinary shortage because I think it's, there's just so much more to it than just that. Um, but um, I get our get capacity, spay neuter capacity challenges, veterinary capacity challenges. I don't know how how we'd phrase it, but my, uh, that's one of my predictions is that that is going to continue. So that's sort of pretty conservative prediction. Um, and then it's not that necessarily that it's going to continue, but that we're going to um, be better address it. I hope so. Your prediction that we're going to we're going to be doing something more about it. I hope so. Either find you know finding ways to work with our veterinarians more efficiently um, and appreciating our veterinary technicians and maybe paying them more but giving them more responsibility. Um, I think that's the the way that we're going to see a lot of of change because it seems that that uh, across all all constituencies the role of the vet tech um, that there's you know a lot of um, support behind that of um, professionalizing that, giving them a bigger bigger scope of, of duty. Um, there's so much more that they can be doing to, to relieve the burden of the veterinarian so that they can be doing the stuff, stuff that only they can be doing. Yeah, and I have to also say I am, I don't have the patience for this legislative <laughs> stuff and I've sat in on a couple of meetings with regards in for Vermont and I swear, I, I don't know where you all find your patience because I, I luckily it's on YouTube and I, I could adjust the speed. 
get where I needed to go and, and, you know, scroll through and then people are talking like mice, but I'm still, I get the gist of it and it saves me time because I'm thinking, boy, back in the day when everybody had to sit through and listen to like everybody doing it in real time and traveling to go there to sit and watch it and listen. Oh my goodness. I'm was never made to be a politician. So I thank you for your patience. <laughs> um, and we all you know, can play a role. We all have different, uh, different skill sets and, and strengths. And that's why we, we need this large community so that we can fill all those gaps. Uh, and Jane put a comment in here, paraprofessionals include in vet practice acts, legislative work. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, there's so a lot of legislative work to do to support the, the veterinary, um, not the word other than shortage that, that you're going to pick. Right, whatever. I have to figure out how we're going to phrase it, but yes. Um, excellent. Well, Danielle, thank you very, very much. I think we're going to switch things over here.